So my name is Jim Downs, and I'm pleased to be here on behalf of Hunter. Uh, to wrap up today's session, I guess this might be me watching on video. Hi, welcome. And if you are people sometime in the future watching on video, hello, future people. <laughs> Do you have flying cars yet? <laughs> Do you have video tele? Oh wait, no, we got one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did the election go? No, don't tell me. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, let's see now. So the talk is called "Change, Challenge, and Opportunity: Six Trends Defining the Future of Online Learning." And uh, let's see now, I'm going to get this right. There we go. That's probably not right. No, you don't watch that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. How's that? All right. So, it's kind of funny because various people various many people during this conference talked about how bad a learning experience something like this is nobody did anything about it so i'm doing something about it um there's a back channel and i encourage you to participate there are two ways to participate first of all if you are one of those people who use twitter Anything you tweet with the hashtag ICDE2017 will show up on our back channel. Alternatively, if you are one of those people who do not wish to create an account on a faceless corporation from another country, you can go to bit.ly bit slash ICDE2017 and you will be taken to my version of the back channel. I'm running on my website. You do not have to sign in. You do not have to give your blood type. You do not have to swear your firstborn child. All you have to do is type in a comment. There's a comment window there. And uh, underneath, you can give yourself a name. These are going to be shown live around the world. Please be polite. We know you can be polite. Um, they will also form a part of the video. So uh, whatever you're typing will be there for posterity. So again, please be polite. Uh, now, so I'm going to show those. The way the video is going to work is it'll come out in four pieces. So there we go. So I'm gonna make the back channel active. I should have done that before I minimize. So, oh yeah, and if you have problems with this window, just reload the screen. Reloading makes everything good again. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's uh, the announcement. So, clearly it's working. So I'll minimize this. Oops, I think I, there we go. Minimize that. Reload this. Return the <laughs> See, this is fun already. <laughs> okay. So, there. So, we got all four pieces here now in play. Uh, so, you can see yourselves. You can see me. Now, the problem is that I have what they call the nostril camera here. For some reason, Dell put it at the bottom of the screen instead of the top. So. If I want it to look good, I have to be kind of like this. And I'm not going to give the whole talk like this. So, and, you know, I might move this around from time to time to give people on the video not yet. But I thought, I thought it'd be neat to let you see, let people see you, let people see me. So I don't know how many people, I'll probably never know how many people are online. Um, but uh, there we go. So that's the back channel. Use it, enjoy it, it's there for you. We'll also have a microphone circulating around. Use it, enjoy it, it's there for you. Obviously you have much less anonymity with the microphone. Keep that in mind. Um, but uh, I do want you to feel free to 
interrupt me, make comments, vehemently disagree, whatever. This session isn't for me. Um, I've been having a wonderful time at the conference. This session is for you. So if you don't like the way it's going, you want to make a comment, whatever, please feel free and uh, we'll see where it goes. I have a plan, of course, but I've never been too dedicated to my plans. So, some of you saw the report um, that I did for Contact North, uh, courtesy of Maxime Jean-Louis, uh, who encouraged me to do that. Thank you very much. Um, the report was, it had a long title, Quantum Leaps We Can Expect in Teaching and Learning in the Digital Age, a Roadmap. Um, I think of it as the future of teaching and learning, which would have been a perfectly good title too. Uh, I cover a lot of ground in that report. I can't cover everything that I cover in that report, but um, I'm going to talk about a few highlights, and not really highlights from the report so much, uh, but they're highlights from, if you will, the popular press. And the topics I'm going to talk about aren't so much the six trends I think are going to be big in online learning. They're six trends people kind of think will be big in online learning, and we'll talk about them a bit. Um, keep it kind of fluid. Tech support wisdom. Reloading makes everything good again. Absolutely right. If you would like to make comments on my report, again, this is not about me, it's about you. There is a version on Google Docs. Um, if you go to bit.ly slash quantum edit, you can, uh, I made that up. Uh, you can go to the online version of the report. I was a bit of a coward. I didn't give you editing permission because that would have been a bit of a free for all but anyone can comment on the side of the report. It's a living document. Uh, it's not intended as the final word. I intend to enlarge and extend it to some degree and make it kind of more or less a book-like thing. So do please comment, especially where you think I'm wrong, because it may be a surprise, but I'm not all mine. Not even a Twitter. One of the things that I always think about when I think about the future, especially the future of learning, because there are so many products and ideas and plans and technologies that will do it for us. And even at this conference, we heard about rapid e-learning that will be you know, micro degrees or micro masters that are completed in 18 months and all of that. And it's like, and, and I heard a lot about, especially today, a lot about students as customers and they're getting a product. You don't get learning. You don't buy learning. It's not when we get stuff that we learn. It's when we do stuff that we learn. And so the, to my mind, the e-learning products that will be successful in the future, or the e-learning trends or technologies that will be successful in the future, are those that reach out, engage you, pull you in, and have you doing things. It will never be the product that produces the learning. It will always be the learner that produces the learning. We, whether we're professors or technologists or whatever, are here to help with that. We're not here to deliver stuff. Um, you know, it's not food, uh, it's, it's uh, learning. The new Blade Runner movie is amazing. Go see it on your free night tonight. I saw it, it's quite good, but it's a think piece, right? So, so here, are the, here are these six things. More dropped frames, sorry world. Um, first of all, machine learning and artificial intelligence, we'll look at that a bit. Handheld and mobile computing, or a fair bit of discussion about that around here. Badges and blockchain, everybody's favorite new trend. Internet of things, or as I say, internet of broken things. <laughs> Games, sims, and virtual reality. Uh, translation and collaborative technology. So those are the six areas that I'm going to cover. I have another talk tomorrow where I'm going to extend some of the, the 
the more interesting trends. But I wanted to focus on these to kind of set the stage. I'll plug the talk tomorrow again. So let's begin with machine learning in AI. The first thing you need to keep in mind about machine learning and artificial intelligence is that it has been around for a long time. You might not think that because socially about it has happened in the last few years, um, but it has been. My putative PhD dissertation that never was, was about connectionism and artificial intelligence. And I was writing in the 1980s. This diagram is from a data mining course that SAS offered in 1998. The stuff has been around for a long time. It hasn't changed the world overnight. Probably it won't change the world overnight tomorrow night either. And I think it's really important to keep in mind. Yeah, there's been a lot of progress, but that has been the result of decades of hard work. And there are decades of hard work ahead. Really, there's an AI is one of these terms, artificial intelligence. It gets, it lumps in a whole bunch of different concepts. It's really important to tease out these concepts and understand that we're actually talking about very different things. Active versus passive learning. This is a passive learner being active. Um, okay. There's classic AI, if you will, and that's the stuff that was happening largely in the 1980s, based on decision engines and expert systems. These are rule-based artificial intelligence systems. When people talk about the semantic web in the same breath that they're talking about artificial intelligence, this is the sort of thing that they're talking about. They're talking about computers inferring from generalizations to specific cases. There's a, a second type uh, of artificial intelligence, and the second type and the third type are both based on what we call neural networks. Neural networks are computer systems that are patterned on the way the human brain works, and that is to say, pattern on the idea that you can have collections of individual neurons or units linked together, and if you give them input, they can do interesting things. If that sounds a lot, a lot like connectivism, that's not a coincidence. Connectivism is born out of the same idea. Two major, many minor strands, but two major strands of neural network artificial intelligence. First of all, pattern recognition. That's the idea that if you're out in the jungle and you see something orange and black in and among the green bushes, your brain leaps to the conclusion, that's a tiger. And then the third thing is cluster detection. That's where, again, that's neural network technology. That's where you're getting a lot of the uh, uses of artificial intelligence to generalize or categorize people, sometimes in not the best ways. The idea is that if you took artificial intelligence and applied it to, say, a crowd of people like this and said, cluster these into five groups, it would cluster you into five groups. Um, and I wouldn't be telling you necessarily how to cluster you in five groups. And it would just look at all the characteristics that you have, and then there are different algorithms to do it in different ways, based on whatever cluster you into those groups. I can semi-supervise the algorithm by saying, cluster people into groups by their appearance. Or I could say, cluster people into groups by where they're from, right? And the algorithm would take over from there. That's pretty basic. Um, you know, we think of artificial intelligence as this great magic thing, but the building blocks are really simple. <coughs> so this is a, a massive slide. I'll give you a bigger version of it. So this is from Siemens and Long from a number of years ago. Um, but they take artificial intelligence, apply the concepts to learning analytics, and come up with five major strands of learning analytics. And those five strands still hold today. Uh, first of all, is the course level analytics, learning trails, social network analysis, where a person goes, who a person talks to, etc. 
There's educational data mining. A lot of this is pattern recognition and a certain amount of clustering. Those are the things that predict, you know, you didn't show up for the first five weeks, you'll probably fail, that sort of thing. There's intelligent curriculum. That's a rules-based kind of approach. That's the approach where you're trying to define all the content elements or all the curricular elements according to their semantical properties and then use a rule-based engine to drive the presentation of the materials according to the different topics. Adaptive content often takes this and moves it forward a level, still using the rules-based kind of system, typically, not always, but typically, semantically based content representations and using it to present the right content to you at the right time. But it's based on what you already know and what you don't know, what you've done and what you haven't done, and what the content of the content is. And finally, adaptive learning brings in together social interactions, learning activity, learning support, and tries to bring all of these things together to give you an artificial, artificially intelligent environment. And that really is where you end up with these mobile assistants like Siri or Alexa or the rest, although they're not really working with deep, deep content bases. So that's learning analytics, and when I, when I look at that list, and I say this in the report, it strikes me how unambitious this is. And it really is unambitious, because really, if you look at it, it adds up to a better Google. Uh, it adds up to a better system of giving you stuff. But it's not the sort of thing, to my mind, that's going to push learning forward. It doesn't make you do stuff. It doesn't get you to do stuff. It just serves something up, serves something else up, serves something else up. Oops. Come on. So based on the idea of adaptive learning, we often get the concept of personalized learning. And, and personalized learning is, well, it's adaptive learning basically for individuals. I'll talk about this a lot more tomorrow. But really, if I wanted to say three things about personalized learning, I'd say, to a large degree, it's still based on rule-driven events. To a large degree, these rule-driven events are triggered by user models which in turn means a lot of surveillance, a lot of classification, a lot of categorization. And then in the end, it's purporting to do adaptive learning, but, but ultimately, to my mind, it's serving you the food it thinks that you want, but it's not getting you to eat it. Oh, that's a terrible analogy. <laughs> Rule to self. Do not make up analogies on the fly. Number two, handheld and mobile computing. And Phil Hill's in the audience. I stole your graphic. Thank you. Uh, and that, that should say everything about how I think learning should work. I took this graphic because I really like what it says. And it's kind of hard to see. Let me blow it up a bit here for you. Um, so each one of those little hexagons represents 1% of the target population. It's Phil Hill, so it's probably United States higher education users. But, well, whatever. I mean, the trends are going to be sort of similar, more or less. Um, and it's actually from an EDUCAL survey in 2016. So, um, But what I want you to notice is this. The big blurb, a big red blob on the top, Almost 50%. That's the number of people who own a laptop, a smartphone, and a tablet. The, I don't know what color that is, orangey with green outline, blob on the bottom. That's laptop and smartphone. The people, only three out of 100 have only a smartphone. Now, that's why I say it's probably US. Um, in other parts of the world. Obviously, 
the percentage of the population with only a smartphone is going to be larger, and the percentage of the population with all three is going to be smaller. But to me, it underlines the message. Mobile learning isn't only about developing for the smartphone. And if you think it is, you're really missing the boat. Yes, it is good to have learning resources that look good on a smartphone. I get that. But there are going to be many cases, maybe even the majority of cases, where people are using a larger screen, such as on a tablet or a laptop. Um, and a lot of things are better done on a larger screen. Right off the bat, I can think of typing. Uh, that might be my generation. I see people who can just, but I can't do that. Um, so I, I think that when we're thinking mobile computing, we can be thinking large screen and small screen. We can be thinking large video input as well as smaller input. And we need to be thinking, therefore, about what kind of media is appropriate for what kind of uh, device. I know I'm not telling you any secrets here, or things that people haven't said, but it needs to be said. And my perspective is that the visual stuff, especially stuff for older people, but the visual stuff works better on the larger screens, and the smaller screens really excel in audio and to some degree video. Um, and, you know, there's been a resurgence of interest recently, I'm, I'm quite surprised by this, in the podcast form, the audio podcast, which delights me because I've always loved audio. And I think that's because we're beginning to see that, you know, given the choice between a podcast, an audio podcast, and a video, a lot of people, when they're out with their mobile phone, would rather just listen to something, go about doing whatever they're doing. It was not a bad analogy. <laughs> See, leave, leave these comments, they're for me. So I get reassurance as I talk. <laughs> um, the other thing about smartphones, and I find this really interesting, in North America, we are overwhelmed, especially in the last few weeks, would we'll talk about Apple and the iPhone. That's the orange, not the green. The green is Android. So worldwide, Android is, if you will, destroying the iPhone. In North America, it's not, obviously. And in the United States, especially, it's not. And among rich people, it's really not. But for the most part, Android is winning. Well, what that means, I don't think Apple's going away. So we're in this two operating system world, minimally. That little tiny blue bar at the top is other and means things like Blackberry or Windows or I don't know what else there is. Um, things that basically have been eliminated. What I think that means, and I, I've said this in the paper, I think we're nearing the, the end of the app. I think we're moving into the world where people don't want to develop a separate application for each operating system, whether it's Android or iOS or Windows or whatever. They want, and especially some of the more specialized Amazon things, but they want to design one application, probably in HTML, HTML5, which supports all of the different modalities. And that's what I look to in the future. I don't see the app ecosystem surviving too long. There are numbers, I don't have them on hand, but there are numbers that something like 0.00001% of apps becomes popular. It's, you know, you go to these iStore apps, the App Store or the Play Store, there's a gazillion apps and you will use one or two or maybe 10 of them. Um, it doesn't make sense. These websites make so much more sense. Don't underestimate the need for podcast only. It's not just about video smartphone viewing. Exactly. More interesting to me when I'm talking about mobile computing is microcomputing and micro microcomputing coming up in interesting places. Now Forbes, which 
to my dismay, has one of those ad, you know, adware subscription things. You must turn off your ad blocker. I refuse to turn off my ad blocker. So I have to find other ways of reading Forbes articles that I won't talk to about. But anyhow, Forbes said, so and so, um, they wrote about artificial intelligence on a chip. Now, I want you to think about that. A chip could be the size of my thumbnail. Now, my thumbnail is pretty big. It's not that big. You get artificial intelligence on that, think of the possibilities. But it's not just on the small end. It's on the ridiculously easy to do without very much money end as well. And from O'Reilly, um, there's a story about a guy who built a face recognizing doorbell for about $100. Which means sometime in the future you'll get them commercially for $10. Or you'll probably plug it into your Wi Fi. So you know, you'll, you'll go to the, I don't know what's it called anymore. The store that has all kinds of used stuff, uh, used stuff store, um, and, and you'll get one and you'll stick it on your door and that will be your face recognizing doorbell. Not just, not just a camera, but something that recognizes the face of the person at the door and says, it's Pete, or whatever. That's really interesting to me, because um, I don't like Pete. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. Um, on the more disturbing end, um, I shouldn't say disturbing, but you know, there are implications. There's the thing called the magic band, um, and the hotels, Disney hotels and resorts, hand them out. They're in bright, child friendly colors, and you put the magic band on you, and it tracks you everywhere you go. You use it to pay for rides and treats and things like that. And it doesn't feel like you're being spied on or spending your credit card money. Uh, it's mobile computing, isn't it? I think that you know we're, we're on the cusp of having computers in everything. Uh, not, not just sensors, not just RFID chips, although those are a bit with us now but computers on everything. If you have something, it'll have a computer on it. And a good computer. You know, not one of those Ataris from the 1980s, but something really good. Um, okay. <coughs> now I'm going to give the viewing audience the close-up. <laughs> So the, on, on the video version, they're getting only me. Way back when, uh, I used to tell a story. You know, it's bending down that would make this look good. Uh, it's me adapting to the technology instead of the technology adapting to me. You notice that, right? So we're not quite there yet. We should have a system that does all this whole setup, the cameras, and maybe like a little cover camera. And it just works. And, and everybody who gives a presentation at a conference or in a classroom, they shouldn't have to worry about that. It just works. And that presentation with all of the back channel stuff should just work. And it would be available to people around the world. And we wouldn't have any of these issues about learning management systems or MOOCs or any of that sort of stuff. It would just be us doing our thing in our classroom or in our workplace, because it doesn't have to be just for professors, and people can just watch. And, and I forget what airline it was, I think it's United, they had a thing called Channel 9, which uh, Microsoft calls uh, its internal uh, newsletter now, or exchange, or whatever it is. I don't work for Microsoft, so I don't get to see it, but I know it exists. And Channel 9 was great because you're sitting there on the airplane like this, because it's United, um, and you can hear the air traffic control chatter, including your own pilots. So that's really good. Uh, I would go for a whole flight listening to that because it was so interesting. And that should be available. And we should be able to watch the cockpit of an airplane while it's in flight, while they're doing all of their stuff that they're doing, and just watch it. 
because you don't want to have a back channel to the pilot, so that might be a bit distracting. <laughs> but in other cases, you could have a back channel, and you could ask questions. That, I know that's not on the slide, but that's what I think we're moving towards. Something that's just, it's just there, it's us sharing as we do things, and it's whoever's curious, who wants to watch, watching it, trying it out for themselves, having a conversation, and so on. But what I want to talk about, and this is a first step toward that. So this is performance support. This is, well, I, years ago I used to talk about the virtual fishing rod. And you'd cast your line into the water, and your fishing rod would say to you, hey, you've never fished, have you? That was a terrible cast. And you look at your fishing rod, and then because your fishing rod doesn't have a screen, you haul out this and you wave them together and it comes up on your screen and Joel the angler says, hi, I'm your fishing rod. Let me tell you how to do it right next time. And you try it a few times and it's got sensors inside it. And Joel the angler says, that's much better. You're doing really good now. That cast went 125 feet. You're sure to get a fish soon. Now you'll need some bait, uh, you know, stuff like that. I thought that was the future, and this is a thing that actually exists now. It's a tennis rack, because tennis players are richer than fisher people, as it turns out. And it's got an integrated performance support system in the racket. And if you follow that link, it's to fortune, I might say rich people. Uh, that's from 2014, so it's three years old now. A tennis racket that teaches you to play tennis as you're playing tennis. And I know, because I've seen several people ask this, almost all of you are from the university sector, university professors. This is about as far away from what you do in your class as you could possibly imagine. This is going to be the learning of the future. And part of the question, part of the thing that's going to be facing us is, what are you, Kai, what are you going to do? Um, in the 10 years or so, when this comes mainstream, and it's becoming mainstream. We have people like Phil Hill on that, and they do their projections, and they look at all the colleges and universities, and they say, well, the use of learning management systems isn't declining. Well, no, not if you look inside colleges and universities. But if you look outside colleges and universities, nobody's using learning management systems. Nobody. None. They're using all kinds of other things. So if learning outside the university and college overtakes learning inside the university and college, then all of a sudden it doesn't matter if every college and university is using a learning management system. <laughs> Way off topic. Sorry. Okay, let's go back to scene one. I'm really enjoying my scene shifter. I hope that's working for you. It's the first time I've done it like this. That's what you call experimenting. Because you should live on the edge. It's more fun. Number three, badges and blockchain. I don't think there's a big future here. Everyone else does. Well, maybe not everyone else, but there's a, boy, there's a lot of hype around this thing. Um, so let's let's think about this for a bit. This is the, the Mozilla backpack. And the reason why I don't think it's going to be a thing is this. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons, but this is this is probably the key one. Uh, take the average university diploma. Four years, say 10 courses a year, 40 courses. Yeah, give or take, right? Um, so if you had one badge per course, that's 40 badges. But this is for micro learning, right? So you're not going to have one badge per course. It's like one badge for maybe an hour's worth of work. But an hour's worth of work, let's, let's convert that to class time. That's not really a good conversion, but that's about maybe 40 hours worth. Depends, right, on the class and how you organize them. I would say it's 20 hours, just because, you know, you're more efficient if you're using badges. So 20 hours, so it's 20 badges in a course. 40 courses, that's 800 badges. Who's gonna display 800 badges anywhere? We haven't 
fixed the problem with badges. So, you know, and badges, to me, badges are intended to make people who've done one or two or three hours worth of work think they've accomplished the same as three university courses, or like it's almost a degree. You know what I mean? I, I think that there's a lot of hand waving out in there, and people haven't run the numbers. It's a really simple number. It's actually about 40 hours per course, 1,600 badges. So it's not going to be a backpack, it's going to be a sash, one of the long sashes that goes all the way down. And that's just for your formal learning. So, so, all the people love badges. And associated with that is the blockchain. And the first person I heard talk about this is Doug Delshaw, although others have taken it out of court since, the way of our field. Um, the idea was, use the blockchain for open badges, he says, and then we could prove beyond reasonable doubt that a person receiving badge Y is the same person who received, or who created evidence X. So, okay. So that kind of solves the problem, provided that we didn't fool the input mechanism. This is, the blockchain only applies to the record. What is the blockchain? Here it is really simple. I'm oversimplifying it, but if you have this picture in your mind, it'll do. Take a transaction, any kind of transaction. Encrypt that transaction. And there's a whole mechanism for that. And that's what generates bitcoins and stuff. Encrypt that transaction. Take that encrypted version, put it at the end of a chain of other encrypted versions, and we'll have a short chain of those, that'll be a block. Make that public. So nobody can change the transaction without changing the encrypted version of the transaction. It's a matter of public record. And you're just keeping adding these, these encryptions to the block you have a permanent record of your transaction. Oversimplified. A lot of tech there. But that's the basic concept. And so the, the suggestion is, if you earn a badge, you and the badge granting institution will record that in the blockchain. It will be encrypted and added to the blockchain. And there you go. Now you have proof, public proof, that you did this. Okay, well, yeah. it's not a bad idea. So everybody's heard, heard of Bitcoin, which is in the middle of a Bitcoin bubble. Separate issue aside, but uh, is it a dangerous prediction to say that Bitcoin's going to collapse? No, it's not. Everybody's making that prediction that Bitcoin is going to collapse. So Bitcoin is going to collapse. Uh, I think so too. I, I, I just don't see it being sustainable. But again, separate issues. Ethereum is really similar to Bitcoin. And they have a type of coin called Ether. And in fact, there's a whole bunch of digital currencies. Bitcoin is only the first one. But there's a whole bunch of others. Some of them using better algorithms, right? So, and that's part of the reason why Bitcoin will peak and then collapse. Uh, the problem with the with Ethereum is people hacked the input of Ethereum and stole, I forget the exact number, but it's something like 16 million Ether, which is gazillions of dollars. It was a huge theft. And they had to go back, rework Ethereum, and just just this week they're going through what's called a hard fork. And, and it broke, too. <laughs> uh, um, so, Ethereum is a platform, Bitcoin is not. Yes and no, right? There's no Bitcoin without the Bitcoin platform, really. And Ethereum as a platform does more than just count money. I get the distinction, you're right. You kind them out like, um, anyhow. But it's a good idea, right? Imagine if you could have contracts written in blockchain 
then you'd have a public record of your contract. Of course, not every. And the thing is, it's encrypted, so you have a public record of your contract, but other people can't read it. So it's perfect for business. <laughs> Hyperledger is an extension of the same idea, where you have a, an extended shared ledger database between different um, different organizations and different companies. So. There is this whole layer of encrypted distributed transactions coming, right? Some of them will be successful, some of them won't. When people try to do specific predictions, what will be, what won't be, that's where it gets hard. The general technology will work. It will not, and none of us will work with it. Uh, we might work with the outcomes of it, but, you know, with some very few exceptions, maybe some of you do some Bitcoin or cryptology programming, but you know, it's, it's like the inner workings of the, uh, the ATM bank machines, right? We use them, but we don't, and, and therefore we use the encryption and, and the authentication that keeps people from stealing money from the system, but none of us actually use it, if that makes sense. It's only in the universities that mix these badges as pieces of courses outside the ed sector, I'm reading here, that are used for recognition of professional practice and convey real value. Yes, but how much, right? How much professional practice? Is it an hour's worth or 40 hours worth? If it's an hour's worth, what really are you measuring? Uh, I think you should seek to better understand blockchain before you knock it. Yeah. I'm not really knocking it, I'm just knocking Bitcoin. So how is all this going to be used in education? So the, the, the big use is in learning records. And, and I've talked about personal learning records a lot over the years. They break down into three major categories. First of all, actual activity records, which are stored in a learning record store and encoded using a language called XAPI. Second is portfolios, artifacts, and evidence, and that, I think, is the real evidence that we will be using to evaluate learning in the future, to evaluate learning in the future. And often, that will be used to produce open educational resources, much like this talk, right? If you think, think about the process that's happening here. Um, so you have some guy up in front of you giving a talk. This talk will be recorded and the related materials will be made available online. Somebody down the road looks at that talk, listens to it, or as much of it as they want to, looks at the slideshow, etc., and makes a decision for themselves. This person knows what he's talking about, or this person does not know what he's talking about. Some listeners will draw the conclusion that they should not bring me in to talk about Bitcoin. Fair enough. I accept that. Um, others will say, this person knows what he's talking about. But you, you see what's happening here. It's not a certificate. It's not a credential. It's not a badge. It's actual evidence of the stuff that I do that gives you an impression of whether it's worth listening to me or not. That's possible for me because I put all my stuff on my website, the presentations, the papers, etc. But if as time goes by, more and more individuals will do that. And as more, because it gives them an edge in the marketplace. So I got my edge in the marketplace. I'm not special, as the Bitcoin critic will tell you. Um, but that's where I got my edge in the marketplace. Other people say, well, look, they'll hire him. If I do the same thing, I'll get hired too. Uh, because it's you a know, pretty low bar. So, but then... After a while, if other people are doing it, then everybody's doing it. And then why do you need diplomas, certificates, badges, or any of the rest of that infrastructure? And then why do you need bit or blockchain for any of that stuff? Right? You have the evidence in front of you. Their own personal learning records, their own portfolio, the activities that they have undertaken, the things that they've read, the people that they've talked to, the places that they've gone, the projects that they've worked on, the code that they've contributed, the forests that they've taken care of, the people that they've tended to in the hospital, all of that is available. 
and subject to the uh, judgment of the individual made available to the public. <laughs> That's a good, interesting, long comment. So I look at things like Sony's plan to launch a testing platform powered by blockchain as, on the one hand, very futuristic and yes, but ultimately irrelevant. Who cares? You know, I mean, okay, you could have a testing platform, but I'd rather go look at the actual work that the person did. And if it's for things like, you know, being a, a brain surgeon or an airline pilot or things like that, let's look at what they actually did in the simulation. I'd rather know that my brain surgeon did a hundred operations just like mine in a simulation rather than pass the test, even if the results are certified by blockchain. So, micro credentials, I don't really see as, as being a big thing. I think they're a thing right now. Um, I understand why people want to use them to recognize professional development, where there is currently no recognition of professional development. But I think that they're a temporary thing and that we're going to overcome them and look at actual performance. Um, there's also there's a whole conversation I could have about competencies, but I can't have that here. But competencies are kind of in the same category. But there is a big project, the Competencies, competencies and Skill System Project. It's part of ADL, Advanced Distributed Learning. There's a huge effort underway by them and others, IEEE's Learning Technologies Standards Committee, which I'm on, so I'm following all of this, uh, to record learning activities, to associate them with competencies, to use competencies to build up competencies-based learning, to use the acquisition of competencies in order to um, to validate people for degrees or credentials or whatever. And it's going, well, it's going to be a big thing. It is a big thing. It's going to be very hyped, very marketed. I'm not convinced it will be that useful. I'm partially, I'm not convinced it will be that useful because I don't think we can get competencies right. Um, I saw us as a community try to categorize learning objects, and that to a large degree was an utter failure. After years of effort and long learning object metadata standards, we found that in actual practice people use about seven meta metadata elements to describe learning <coughs> objects. Competencies are ten times more complex than learning objects, I don't think that we as a community and the wider world as a community will come together and have common standards of competencies. Uh, there will be some very influential sets of competencies, mostly issued by governments or by professional associations. But even when you get right down to what counts as proof or evidence of completion of, of a competency, I don't think we'll see agreement. So, again, this is the assessment dilemma, and like I said, I think that assessment is going to be based on how we perform in the community. We're trying to see what's in people's heads, if you will, or as I would say more accurately, how what's in people's heads is structured, and the best evidence of that will be what they actually do in the community where they work. How do you know somebody will do a good job repairing their car? By his test scores at mechanic school or by what he did on Pete's Chevy the day before. I know that I listen to Pete complain about the mechanic rather than look at the stellar test score. And I think that as our communications mechanisms become more sophisticated, that'll become a lot easier. And again, there's, there's a whole pile of technology behind that, reputation systems, social networks, etc., etc., 
but I think that's where we're headed. Internet of Broken Things. Uh, that's apparently an actual picture. I think it's at Heathrow, which itself is a broken thing. Sorry, British people, but you know, you live there. Um, the main message I have here about Internet Things is Internet of Things is here. It's not a thing that's coming, it's a thing that's here. Um, in your office, most of your devices are already part of the internet. Uh, in cities, things like uh, traffic signals are all synchronized. There are sensors doing everything from air quality to noise, uh, traffic patterns. When I, I commute to work now, that's something new for me, but invariably I'll take out Google Maps and look for the red spots on the map, which is real-time traffic monitoring generated by the Internet of Things. Google collects data from all kinds of devices, brings it together, summarizes it, and presents it on a nice easy map. I love it. It's perfect. Manufacturing, robots, etc., vehicles, we're into the age of smart cars, smart trucks, etc., which will drive better than we drive. And the big question in 20 years will be how can we justify letting a human being drive? It's way too dangerous. And you know, and people say, well, you know, to fly a plane, you need years of training and a special license, and cars are more dangerous. Um, so, and somebody will be out there, you have to pry this Chevy from my cold day. Uh, healthcare, uh, you know, Fitbit, etc. cetera, I, I use internet, thing, internet of Things devices to monitor my cycling. Um, and, you know, it's not just passive tracking. When I monitor my cycling, I cycle more. I cycle more because I set targets for myself. It's a simple feedback loop. Um, but it's one I've observed and it's one I see that, that happens with other people. Agriculture, I live in the middle of an agricultural area. And in between the solar panel arrays, and there are solar panel arrays out there, uh, big ones, um, there are cornfields and wheat fields and uh, rye and uh, soybeans, and all of those have little sensors for soil humidity and all of that, etc. Internet of Things is here. The main enablers are all here. Microcomputing, well, I talked about computer size in my thumbnail. AI is size in my thumbnail. Wireless communication and communication standards, here. Sensors, here. Uh, and then remote control and interfaces here. All the key elements are here. Um, you, know, you go to your grocery store, uh, you know those self checkouts that you do, right? That's Internet of Things. The tomato can has RFID in it. That's how the automatic checking scan knows that you're not cheating when you claim that it's really a can of pea soup because pea soup is cheaper. So, what's going to happen in learning? Well, uh, Phil Hill in his talk talked about the future of the LMS, and the future of the LMS is extending from the wall garden it is today to a system using specifications like learning tools, interoperability, to work with things outside itself. And so now the learning management system is working with things like uh, blogging tools or wikis or you know, live interactive um, video sessions, etc. Eventually, not right away, it's going to take some time, but eventually these systems will work even further out with parts of the Internet of Things. Uh, I have in mind, for example, there's one project that we worked on at NRC. I just changed the name of it and I can't remember, but basically it's a neurosurgery simulator. And you have a little 3D headset that you look through. You have actual implements. You work on something that actually feels like the human brain. It even squishes. Um, and you're burning tumors. And you're burning tumors, and you, you, you can almost smell the burning, but you can't. Uh, but if you can imagine it, you can. And you see the little bits of blood in that. And we connected that using XAPI to a learning record store, which can feed back into the learning management system. So we can launch this thing using LTI, have a person do virtual brain server, 
surgery, have it report back into the learning management system as part of a class and you get graded on your surgery. That's the kind of thing. So your learning management system in the future will be able to interoperate with your bicycle or your car or your tennis racket or whatever is out there in the Internet of Things and use those as part of the learning, part of the virtual learning that you're doing. And if you think about it, this gets online learning away from the computer screen, away from even your device, and out into the world, interacting with real world objects, some of which, yes, will be broken. So what happens when companies know all of your devices, etc.? What happens when these devices break? These are questions that we're going to have to face in the future. I'm not going to make all six, am I? This one's short. It's five now when you plan to wrap up. <laughs> it's got to be pretty soon. Happily, I have a talk tomorrow, so I can pick up on some of that. I'm just going to say about games and virtual reality. Um, see, I took too much at the top. The, anyhow. Um, I think they're going to be interesting, but I think they're going to be neat. They're going to be useful, but they're not going to be everywhere. Um, that little list is the list of types of people who use Oculus Rift. Some people freeze, some people smile, some people scream, some people fall over, etc. Um, I think that immersion is a question of belief. If you believe it, it's virtual reality. And to date, there's been far more emphasis on fidelity of experience and gee whiz effect. But all you have to do is get people to sustain belief. And that requires a lot less technology than you might think. So I, I think that the thought behind the technology ultimately is going to be a lot more important than the technology. Translation and collaborative technology. The, the main observation here is I put these together uh, because I think together they are going to reshape an awful lot of things. When you're sitting around in a group of people like that and in fact you're speaking five different languages but you all understand each other because of, oh, say, whoops. See, I don't have a mouse. No, I can't. Uh -oh. uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. There. <laughs> you know, we have things like this. This is from the, um, the new Google phone, the new Pixel phone. And like the Apple phone, there's no headphone jack. Unlike the Apple, Apple phone, the Google wireless earbuds, they say, I haven't tested this, can translate languages on the fly. So think about that. Think about you're traveling somewhere and your phone and your earbuds could translate for you. Translate what they're saying, translate what you're saying to them. Uh, I think that's incredible. I think that reshapes how we communicate with each other for the better. Um, I like this graphic that I stole because it talks about how interactivity and collaboration are, are going to be features not just of our work environments but of the technology itself. And it talks about some of the distributed underlying technologies that are going to make this possible, things like Docker, and virtual box and the rest of it, cloud storage, Google Drive. We're collaborating on my futures paper because I'm using Google Drive, which is cloud storage. Uh, Docker is a way of running computers in a box so that you can run a Linux machine on a Windows machine, or you can run a dedicated database. Um, and if you need more database capacity, you just launch another box and another box and another box so that your, your database can expand as demand expands. The, uh, the early MOOCs uh, the, from uh, Stanford, the Stanford AI MOOC, were built on technologies like Docker that allowed them to 
quickly scale up, and that's how they handle uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of students. And so there's the whole cloud infrastructure. So what does learning become from all of this? It becomes shorter. <laughs> it becomes contact center, anytime, any place, and contact sensitive. It becomes engaging, immersive, and wanted. And it becomes personal. And that, somewhere there, is what I'm talking about tomorrow. Shorter tomorrow. Thank you very much. I heard the answer is 43, and I'm just trying to fool you with the thing is 42. <laughs> with all the people in the know going to 43. <laughs> okay, video people, that's all. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn you off now. Thank <laughs> you.